on this Tuesday morning. Shares of Capital One uh, rallying after filings showed that Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway took a nearly $1 billion stake in the company, buying 2.6% of the shares in the first quarter. This says Buffett dumped shares in Bank of New York Mellon and U.S. Bank Corp. Now, this is something he had sort of talked about that he was doing here. Um, and, you know, my caveat or my disclaimer, whenever we talk about 13F filings, they are a snapshot Mm -hmm. of one day. Now, Warren Buffett, as we know, tends to buy and hold stakes, but we also don't know what's on the other side of the equation. Is he shorting? Is he hedging? Uh, Are there things he is not disclosing? So it doesn't give us necessarily a full picture of what's going on, but it does give us a little bit of an insight into what he is doing. Yeah, uh, you know, we, even in our discussions ahead of the show, it was pointed out by our team that, yeah, this is also one of the largest lenders on a financial basis for auto purchases. Auto purchases here, especially um, for Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, uh, they have already taken a, another stake. Last year, they took a stake in Ally Financial and that one of the other large player in autos. So um, within that kind of lending capacity, it'd be interesting to see where they perhaps are looking across the automotive landscape and where uh, for some of the loans that both uh, Capital One and Ally Financial, where that is appetizing for them to add on to their portfolio right now. Yeah, I want to bring Katie Kaminsky back yeah. into this discussion because I think the regional bank discussion is still so interesting. Is that an area where you're looking at either banks broadly, regional banks specifically? Because it feels like there are a lot of headwinds still to come um, in this group. Yes. I mean, I think this comes back. What I love that you're talking about Buffett here right now is he's a value investor. So they're looking at companies where they see value over the long term. And we got to remember they were very successful back in 2008 and sifting through uh, the rummage in a, in a very extreme financial uh, environment. But what's interesting now is really the fixed income angle of this and which of these banks are the best positioned to deal with a very different rate environment, either inverted curve or as we see yields might be moving and we see capital rolling over and people trying to refinance it. I think that's where the interesting opportunity has come in the space is figuring out which banks are going to be better positioned to move as sort of capital costs have changed significantly um, going through sort of this tightening cycle that we've been through right now. And we've already seen that there's trouble in the waters with what happened earlier this year. And so the question is going to be which other banks are better positioned to move with the situation and which of them are going to have more challenges because perhaps they're in an area, like you said, autos that that is better or another area which is is going to have more challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Katie, we have to, uh, we got to shift gears here a little bit um, just after the opening bell. Katie Kaminsky joining us this morning uh, for all things uh, discussion wide ranging, uh, I might add, debt ceiling all the way into Fed policy. Katie Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex. Thanks so much, Katie.